and uh, I want to introduce my co-presenter, uh, Amy harris Halk, Head of Research, Outreach, and Instruction, a noted APA citation expert within <laughs> libraries. Of course, I am Jenny Dale. I introduced myself already, but I will tell you that I was, um, that Jim Carmichael for many years referred to me as the citation librarian. Um, so it seemed appropriate um, for me to share uh, some of my, some of my unique citation knowledge with all of you today. So uh, we are going to go ahead and get started. Okay, so I'm trying this for the first time. This is a Zoom poll. I'm going to launch polling. We're going to see if it works. Yes. Great. It's working. So this just gives us a sense, uh, or I think it's working. I don't know. Yes, it's working because people are doing it. Um, oh, I'm so excited. Ugh. You know, there's some other uh, pretty cool history types in here. So I am very excited. 54% uh, have voted. So if you want to get your vote in, there's no prize or anything. I'm just curious. Oh, thanks, Tiffany. Tiffany said that poll worked really well. All right, so I am just going to go ahead and end polling, and I think it'll display. Um, so we have here um, a question I asked how many of you have used APA to write papers or cite sources before. 88% um, of respondents said yes. 13% of respondents gave the shrug emoji that I gave as an option. Maybe, who knows, who can remember back that far sometimes. Um, I also asked you when you think that APA style was first codified, and I'm excited to tell you that all of you are wrong. It was actually 1929, the one that no one voted for. I will also tell everyone as uh, I'm sharing these results here. Um, <laughs> at Patrick, I can't say for sure uh, that that's what caused the Great Depression, but I hope not. Um, so uh, I will tell everyone that I was going through some of this content yesterday with my husband, some of the historical content I'm about to share, and he pretended to fall asleep. So you're all in for a treat. All right, here we go. Okay, so we tried it. We did a Zoom poll. Okay, I'm ready for the next one. So to keep with the theme, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I'm writing, thank you. The, in the beginning, APA was codified in 1929. In this article, instructions in regard to preparation of manuscripts from the Psychological Bulletin. Um, it was a little seven page piece, six, six seven pages, it kind of depends on how you count. Um, very short, not a lot of detailed information, um, but the first time really that APA was uh, codified in any way. And all of these authors are actually people who were participating in an editor's conference um, for editors of psychology and anthropology journals. So here's a delightful snippet from that article. And also, don't worry, I'll share my Zotero library with you that has all of these great uh, historical artifacts. Um, one of the things that I want to point out is the second paragraph that I have here in this snippet. The committee realizes that it neither has nor wishes to assume any authority in dictating to authors, to publishers, or to editors, but it suggests the following recommendations for use as a standard of procedure, to which exceptions would doubtless be necessary, but to which reference might be made in cases of doubt, and which might be cited to authors for their general guidance in the preparation of scientific articles. So I read that as, we actually aren't allowed to tell you what to do, but here's what you should do. So it's a good, uh, it's, it's actually a lot more flexible of an approach than what we typically see now. Um, and as you'll see as we go through the history here, uh, changes were made. So in that same article, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. 
Um, this included formatting of manuscript content. That was kind of the, the biggest chunk of it. But there was also a section under choice of references um, where they describe references should be sufficient for the orientation of the article. Only significant titles, none unknown to the author and none for filling should be included. The author should acquaint himself, himself, notice the language, with bibliographies on related subjects and should cite them, but he should not duplicate them. So what I think is interesting about this is that it's not about, it, it's really focusing a lot on quality over quantity. You should be citing the kinds of sources that are considered important, but I also find it very funny that there's a note in here that says you shouldn't cite things that you haven't read and you also shouldn't cite things that are just for filler. Okay, ready for the next one. And still in the beginning, what we see in that article, um, it set up what, how we see APA now as an in-text citation and reference list style. Um, so they describe in-text citations, although they recommend the use of footnotes back in this period, which is pretty different than how we do it now in APA. Um, and then they said bibliographical references placed at the end of the article in numerical or alphabetical sequence. So giving again some, uh, some structure, but some flexibility built in. The first revision of that article was another article, um, and it was from a Psychological Bulletin, again, um, and it is available. It's much longer, as you can really see there, um, and it's from 1944. So 1929, 1944, some pretty important points in our history when I assumed that um, editors were like, hey, we're important too. Let's talk about APA style. Um, so this is a, the first big revision. And the updates in this revision included, they had a huge focus on editorial policies, including, and this to me is interesting, um, suggestions of, of appropriate venues for different kinds of research articles that people might be writing and submitting. They have nine pages of this longer article on bibliography preparation, although six of those nine pages was a very comprehensive list of journal title abbreviations. It's not super interesting reading, but apparently it was really, really important to them at the time. And a lot of this, if you read some of the sources that discuss sort of the history of APA as an organization, the American Psychological Association, as well as the history of APA style, a lot of it is about being seen as scientists and being accepted as scientists in the way that they are creating um, sources and sharing those sources. So more in-depth stuff. And one of the things that I think is cool um, here is this was when we see italics being introduced for the first time. Presumably there were um, new sort of, you know, typographical options for people. And it included a sample bibliography of what your bibliography could look like. So here we have the first of its name, the actual publication manual of the APA. This was published in a, uh, a basically a supplemental edition of, again, Psychological Bulletin, where all the cool stuff happens. Um, so pretty lengthy. And this came out in 1952. And then this particular, which is considered the first edition, was revised twice, 57 and in 67. And the second through seventh of its name. Subsequent editions came out uh, as follows. So we had the second edition that came out in 1974. Um, something pretty significant happened between 74 and 83, which I'll talk about. But 83 is when the third edition came out a great year, a year that a lot of amazing things happened. 1994 was the fourth edition, 2001 the fifth, 2009 the sixth, and 2019 the seventh. One of the things, yeah, Sean, me too. That's why I said it. Um, the, one of the things that I think is interesting about it is I would expect a citation style like APA to be coming out with updates more frequently. Um, particularly in the time since 2001, where if we've seen just a, a proliferation of different source types and different sort of source access points. Um, but, we, but we really haven't seen that, and it's actually something that uh, librarians, publishers discuss a lot as a point of frustration. And then I think I just maybe have one more slide here. So 
there were concerns that were being raised about biased language in between some of these publications. Um, and I pointed this out because there were, there were two major publications related to this. Um, but I also point this out because as Amy will talk about, that's a big focus of the seventh edition is, is avoiding biased or using non-biased language. So two major updates since 1975 and 1977 were regarding the use specifically of non-sexist language, and they were meant to update the second edition of the APA publication manual. So these were um, written up by uh, different, it's like they were task forces for uh, the use of non-sexist language in graduate education and psychology for the most part. So this is something that APA as a style has been thinking about for a while, probably not as much as we would have liked them to think about it, um, but it is something that has sort of been on their mind for a while and we can see some evidence of that again in the seventh edition, which is what Amy's gonna talk about. Oh, by the way, this is just a gift I have created for you. Um, I will put the link in the chat. Um, if you want to look at my Zotero library, a brief history of APA, you can see lots of cool different articles that I used to help me build this history. I'll put it in there. Uh, and then I will turn things over to Amy, who will bring us up to date. All right. So can you hear me? Okay. You sound great. Great, thank you. Um, so just one thing that I'll point out about the, um, the non-sexist language from the 70s is actually that's why APA uses initials for first names instead of whole names like some of the other citation styles. Um, and that was one of their um, ways to attempt to combat bias against people citing articles written by women. So, um, that is why we use initials for, um, for APA citations instead of um, whole names like other styles do. Sorry, I just, I forgot to put library help chat on um, silent, so now it's gone. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about APA 7, um, the next frontier. Um, I'm really happy about these slides that I made. Okay, so basically, um, in my opinion, and like Jenny said, I've spent a good bit of time with APA 7. Um, I feel like it's a lot more streamlined and easier to use than the previous edition. Um, this version came out in October, which um, if you have ever been a student or someone that might help someone create citations, um, October is a fantastic month to come up with a new edition of a citation style because it's right in the middle of the semester. Um, it's fine. So, um, but it did come out in October. Most people did not switch right away. Um, some people went ahead and switched in January and some people are waiting still. Um, so we're sort of still in transition mode between APA 6 and APA 7. So I'm gonna talk about three different things. I'm gonna talk about paper formatting guidelines, um, I think that people tend to think of APA style as the citations, but there's actually more to it than that. There's a whole APA format for manuscripts, um, and then we'll talk about in-text citations, and then we'll talk about the bibliography stuff. So the first thing that I'm happy to share with you all is that it's official, one space after all the periods. Maybe you've been doing that for a while, I have been doing it for a while, but now APA says that it's okay. So congratulations, one space after all periods. And actually one thing I'll say that I didn't, act, I didn't realize until I started reading the seventh edition was um, that we were supposed to put one space after the initials in the people's names and two spaces after a period at the end of a sentence, which is very confusing. Um, so yeah, I, I love it. I personally am a huge fan of one space after the period. So I'm very excited that that is APA sanctioned now. Um, we do have now a greater degree of what I'm calling font freedom. I know this is for you, Jenny. I put this in for you because I know how much you love fonts. And I did have some questions and when I've done this presentation for classes before about fonts that are now acceptable. Um, 
they acknowledge that um, screen readers and technology exists where people can kind of take fonts and adapt them um, for their own purposes. So they have um, kind of expanded their definition of the fonts that are considered acceptable. Um, of course, this is just kind of the APA style ones. If you're writing for a particular journal or something like that, um, publishers will probably have specific um, fonts that they want people to use. Um, the one exception that they do make is if you have figures. So in your, you know, if you have uh, graphs and charts and things like that in a work, you have to use a serif font for that. And that's, you know, Times New Roman is a serif font. Georgia, I think, is also serif. Um, so, you know, the ones with the little lines at the bottom. Um, computer code should all be in a monospace font. Um, I had to look that up. That's just a font where all the characters are the same width. Um, but again, publishers may vary, but I'm pretty excited that um, a wide variety of fonts are considered acceptable now, inclu including Calibri, because I'm not a huge fan of fonts, and that's the default on Microsoft Word now, so I don't have to change it, so I'm pretty excited. So one thing that's interesting from a student perspective, um, one thing that I've run into as the Librarian for the School of Education is when um, students have to do like a full-on APA paper, they were confused about what to do for, you know, department that they, you know, so the, the manuscript title page was really meant for researchers and not for students. Um, so now they've created one that's especially for students. So um, here, and I'm, I'm just going to apologize in advance for the deep dive into nerddom that we're about to go on. Um, so this is what it should look like. You can see it's got the page number up at the top. Um, you can see it's got the names of the people. You know, we've got obviously the title at the top, two space, two double space spaces down, and then authors, course, or department and school, course number, professor, and due date. Um, so that is what the student title paper would look like. Um, one thing actually that I'll say about the manual is that it has a lot more examples in it. And I don't know, again, how much time you've all spent with the APA style guide, but the new one does have a lot more concrete examples um, than the older one does, which I really appreciate because it can be hard. You know, you can read a paragraph about how to do something, but um, yeah, closet nerds, sure. Um, some of us are just nerds. I guess some of us are closet nerds. Um, so this just gives you a very straightforward example of what a student title paper would look like, title page. Um, one thing also, and you'll notice, I mean, we talk about running heads. Again, this is really in the APA weeds. Um, I will point out that the student title page does not have the running head in it at all. Um, which is another thing that students have been confused about in the past is how to do a running head, what a running head is. Um, but for the manuscript format, um, we no longer have to use the word running head at the beginning of the running head. And just so everybody knows, the running head is a shortened version of the title that appears at the top of every page. Um, and in the past, the first page would say running head colon and then whatever it was. And then subsequent pages would just have the running head. So then you had to go in and set your headers so that the first page was different than the other pages. Anyway, it was a big deal. So now you can have the same header on all the pages. Um, it's a lot easier to set up in Word. So that's really nice. Also, I'll share these slides with y'all after this is over, or we will share the slides with you. Um, there are page numbers for everything that go with the new version of the APA style guide. Um, I will also admit in this room that I grabbed my work copy of APA style guide. So if anybody has a question about APA while we are working remotely, I have my book. Um, so just let me know if you have questions. All right, so now in-text citations, this is another change that I think really streamlines um, the process. So one thing that has changed now is that if you have multiple authors, if you have three or more authors, you only list the first author. Um, before, I think it was seven? 
some larger number um, that you had to list individually. So it's really nice from a creating citations standpoint, but also from a reader standpoint, you, in text citations can be sort of, they can kind of interrupt the flow of your writing. Um, and so this is a little bit shorter than, um, than it looked in previous editions. So um, the two author format is still the same. You see, I've got Granger and Potter. I think that we would all agree that Hermione Granger would be the first author in any piece of writing in which she participates. Um, so that's why she's listed that way. So that's the, basically the big change to um, the in-text citations is just that anytime there's three or more authors, you only list the first one. All right, so now this is the stuff that people care about the most, the reference list updates. Again, I think that these are all easy changes. Um, let's see. So one thing is that in, when you're citing a book, you don't have to list the city of publication anymore. That is something that I always had a hard time with because um, I just remember when I first learned about citation, you know, I think that was the rule that you had to pick the one that was closest to you. And so I was always confused about, do I pick the first one? Do I pick the one that's closest to my house? What if I'm, you know, somebody in California is reading this, you know, so now that's gone. We don't have to list the publisher location anymore, just the actual publisher. So in this case, the publisher would be Flourish and Plots because I don't know who the publisher of materials in the Harry Potter universe is. Um, so this is one, one potential bad thing, is that in the bibliography, you have to list up to 20 authors in the reference list. Previously, it was seven. Um, luckily for me, um, in my work with the School of Education, we have few to no articles with more than five or six authors. Yes, yeah, sorry, Megan. Um, Megan is, you know, Megan has works that have one million articles. Yes, yes, STEM is really um, a problem. Yeah, Patrick, I really struggled to come up with enough um, people to put in this, um, I think these are mostly members of Dumbledore's army um, who are listed here. And also Malfoy was the last author. So yes, so up to 20 authors in the reference list, which again, yes, is great for the 19th author who would not previously have been um, mentioned on the works cited page. Um, but again, many articles that you will be citing will not have more than 20 authors um, with STEM exceptions usually. So the DOI has sort of been an interesting um, evolution. Um, the DOI, Digital Object Identifier, first came out in the sixth edition. And what it was meant to be was a way to identify um, an article with an alphanumeric, or in this case, just a numeric unique identifier. So when it first came out, it looked this way, up here at the top where it says DOI colon, and then a bunch of numbers and stuff. And then a couple of years ago, sort of in between six and seven, they changed the format to look like this with the, um, the URL, which is convenient because then you can click it. It's a clickable link. Um, but for a while there until this new edition came out, they said you could use either one. So just whichever one um, was listed was okay to use. But now they're saying you've got to go with the one that has the HTTP at the beginning. Luckily, there's a website for this. It's called shortdoi.org because uh, if you're like me, like I can look at this one at the top, the no more, this one and this one and understand that they're probably the same, but I don't know that I, trust myself to convert from one to the other. So you can go to this website that's called shortdoi.org that will, if you plug in the old one, it'll give you the new one. So it will like convert it for you. So that's kind of nice. Um, also, it's cool because they haven't actually done this for all of them. So they're building it as they go. Um, so you actually have the opportunity to add a DOI to the list. So this one, when I was practicing, um, I actually added this one to the catalog of DOIs. So now it's in there for everybody to use. 
So anyway, it's pretty nerdy. So one thing that happened previously when you were using um, APA is that when you were using websites, you had to say retrieved from and then have the URL. Well, everybody knew that that was where you retrieved it from. So now that is gone. You no longer have to say that you retrieved it from there because people understand that if you included a URL, that that is where it came from. So that's exciting. Also, I'm pretty sure that Hermione, did she hyphenate? I don't know. Anyway. So one other thing, you know, it had been, as Jenny said, since 2009, um, since there had been an update. And so there have been a lot of media that have evolved since 2009. Um, so now there are examples um, for citing podcasts, um, social media posts, and things like that. Um, also, one thing that I really like about this version is that for every single reference list example, there's a corresponding in-text example. Um, the sixth edition did not do a great job of telling you how to do in-text citations, so you kind of had to piece it together. Um, I will say for those of you who are already fans of APA style that the APA style blog, which I'll talk about in a little bit, has switched over to APA 7. Um, the APA style blog did a really great job um, between 6 and 7 of sort of serving as like an advice column for APA and telling people um, how to cite things like tweets that didn't exist in 2009. Um, so that has been really helpful and it will continue to exist as new types of information that need to be cited come along. So um, it's really helpful to see how to cite all those different weird things that we might need to cite. All right, so something that I really want to talk a little bit more about is inclusive and bias-free language. And as Jenny said, um, you know, this is something the APA has been talking about since the 70s. Um, they came a long way from the 20s in which they assumed that everybody writing was a ban. Um, so props to them for that. Um, they actually have almost a whole chapter in the book about reducing bias. Um, so my favorite thing about APA 7 is their endorsement of the singular they pronoun. And they kind of take that a step further and say, in addition to using they for folks who use they as their pronouns, that any person whose gender is unknown or irrelevant should be referred to as they. So um, in the past, you know, he or she has been um, an okay way to describe human people but that is no longer accurate. That reinforces the gender binary. And so they are tossing that out and saying that um, everyone should just be referred to as they. They also say that they, them, theirs, themselves, um, though they also say that themself is acceptable. And that was a question that I have um, because I struggle with themselves as a word, but they say themselves or themselves is fine um, for the they pronoun. Hey, welcome, Rachel. Sorry, we're, this is recording. Um, so, you know, the wizard used their wand to do the dishes is my example, because it doesn't really matter if the wizard is a, it, what pronouns that wizard uses, um, they use their wand, doesn't matter. So um, that's a pretty big step pretty excited that the singular they pronoun is part of APA doctrine now. Also, this is really more about research um, to focus on relevant characteristics. Um, you know, if you're studying if, um, you know, old people are better at remembering things than young people, then age is relevant, but maybe gender isn't. Um, and, and, and kind of focusing on the characteristics that actually matter 
Um, you know, so if it doesn't matter the socioeconomic status of your research participants, don't talk about that. Um, also, um, using descriptors with modifiers and writing about gender identity, um, transgender women, cisgender women, transgender men, cisgender men, um, that's how they want to, um, you know, how they recommend identifying people. Um, also, using specific country of origin when writing about racial or ethnic groups, um, Japanese Americans if you can, instead of Asian Americans. Um, just trying to be as specific as possible when using country of origin to describe people. Um, using people first language. And um, I've mostly talked about this, this with um, School of Ed people. And that this is a concept that's very familiar to them. But I'll try to, um, I'll describe in case people have questions about what people first language means. Basically, it means acknowledging the humanity of a person first. Um, so instead of using a term like drug user, it's people who use drugs. So it's putting the people part first people with learning disabilities, um, you know, just kind of using those sort of terms to acknowledge a person's humanity first. Yes, people, people experiencing homelessness is um, much, you know, much better than homeless people um, because, you know, you really want to focus on the fact of their humanity. Um, there are exceptions to this, though. There are some groups that prefer identity first language. Um, deaf people, for example, like a, the big D deaf people, um, as deaf people as a community, um, a cultural group, prefer to be referred to as deaf people as opposed to people who are deaf or people who are hard of hearing. Also, autistic people uh, prefer to be, in, this is broad brushes, but broad strokes, but generally, many people in the autistic community prefer, prefer to be referred to as autistic people as opposed to people with autism. So that sort of language is appropriate as long as that's the language that the group prefers. Does that make sense? I think that's a little complicated. Those are the main two groups that, that come to my mind when I think about um, identity first language is deaf people and autistic people. Um, but again, Things like this, people with learning disabilities, that's relevant if your research study is looking at people with learning disabilities, but whether or not they use drugs is not relevant, so I would maybe leave that out entirely. Um, that's a good question, Sam. Sam asked if APA has a list of what different groups prefer. So in this chapter on bias-free language, it does give some examples. Um, and also some references to additional sources, but I don't think that it's comprehensive. Um, that's a good question, though. I don't know if there's a more um, expansive list on their website or even in um, like the APA style guide. So kind of along along these lines, you know, they use as example like um, person with AIDS as opposed to AIDS victim. Um, just kind of, you know, acknowledging the humanity of people. Um, you know, person with AIDS is a lot more humanizing than AIDS victim. It's another example that they use. Okay, so they have, and, and like I said, there's like half a chapter on um, reducing bias. So they cover a lot of different types of bias. Um, and they do talk, again, I guess this sort of goes along with um, identity first language, but like, and I, I feel like this should go without saying in 2020, but maybe not, but not to refer to people as like the elderly or the gays, which is actually an example from the style guide. So, you know, referring to them as people um, as opposed to the something. Um, so they do talk about you know, again, age and how to refer to people by, you know, a specific age range as opposed to like the elderly. Um, 
you know, things like that. They also talk about, you know, not using um, euphemisms to describe disabilities, but also, you know, just using, again, person first language. Um, gender, again, transgender, cisgender. Um, participation in research is just, a, that's more about volunteers or how you determine who your people are. Um, and also when somebody is a patient. So a patient would be somebody if the research is clinical related, otherwise you wouldn't refer to them as a patient. Um, things like that. So racial and, racial and ethnic identity. Um, you know, it says you can use the terms black and white, but not other color groups for humans. Um, capitalizing terms, they actually go into pretty good depth about um, people of Asian origin, um, indigenous people around the world. They, you know, they talk about how to refer to, um, you know, Native Americans, um, Native North American, referring to a specific, you know, tribe or nation if possible, um, but Native American as like a broader term. And then they also have um, recommended terms for Hawaiian Natives, Alaskan Natives, um, indigenous people of Canada, Australia, Latin America. So it really goes into a lot of depth on how to identify people in a method that they would use to identify themselves, basically. Um, let's see, sorry, I'm jumping around in the chapter while I'm talking to you about this. Um, it does also talk about with socioeconomic status, um, you know, they use the example of, you know, mothers who receive temporary assistance for needy families, as opposed to welfare mothers, um, people experiencing homeless, people who are homeless, um, people in transitional housing instead of the homeless. Um, and also being really aware of the implicit bias that comes in using terms such as low income and poor as sort of like a descriptor for racial and ethnic minorities. Um, so, you know, just keep all those things in mind as well. So, and they do actually have a really, I think, pretty lovely section about intersectionality. So intersectionality, um, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with that term, is um, they describe it as the way individuals are shaped by and identify with a, a vast array of cultural, structural, socio-biological, economic, and social contexts. So, you know, a person can be, um, you know, a person of color, they can be a deaf person, they can have all these different identities, and, you know, there's all these different identities are possible. Um, and that it's important to identify re only relevant characteristics in a research study. So you don't have to explain all of somebody's business um, in a research article just because you're researching them. Um, so, and I would recommend when we get back to work someday, um, reading this half a chapter from the APA Style Guide. And I don't usually recommend that people read style guides they're not that interesting. Um, but this one actually is really helpful, I think, in just making us more aware of how we refer to people and making sure that um, we are always considering their humanity first. All right. Whew. That was a lot. Um, does anybody have questions at this point or Jenny is there anything that you would like to add no I think this was great um, if people have questions please feel free to put them in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself and ask them um, just because I keep forgetting to do this I'm gonna put the um, link to our uh, evaluation our little uh, you know, survey form, I'm struggling. Um, I'm gonna put that in the chat in just a minute here, but um, yeah, please feel free to ask questions. So we do have a question from Rachel, Amy, which is, do we have access to the APA 7 manual online? What a great question. No, we do not. 
Um, we own, we own, we have access to a product that is called Academic Writer, which Rachel, I know that you are familiar with. It is currently um, still APA 6 um, and um, our wonderful, amazing colleague Leah reached out to them back in October um, to ask them when they might be updating <laughs> to the new version and they did not provide a lot of information about when that might be. So um, I really don't know. Hopefully this summer it will be um, it will be updated. Right now, um, I know I personally am no longer a huge fan of the owl at Purdue, but um, they do have both. Um, they do have style guides for both at this point. I just pasted a link into the APA style blog. Um, actually, ooh, they're providing temporary free access to the seventh edition online because of coronavirus. Thank you, APA. Um, wow. Oh, okay, so it's actually on Red Shelf, which is really interesting. Um, which is a, a product that we pointed people to. We actually also can use Vital Source, which is another um, textbook provider that we are working with. So, what a great question. I'm so glad you asked that. Um, also, I will say that Zotero is already updated to the seventh edition. Um, so, if you're using the seventh edition in your work you, and you use Zotero, um, it is there and it is accurate as far as I can tell. Um, it looked really good. It was actually the first one that I saw to update it. Um, so yes, that's the best that we can do for now until Academic Writer decides to update to the seventh edition, but I am really excited that they're providing access online um, through Red Shelf. That's really cool. And also, as I mentioned, I snagged my copy as I was walking out of the building um, whenever that was. So if you have specific questions, you can reach out to me and I can look them up for you. Um, so yes, great question. Does anybody else have a question? Also, that means that everybody can read that section about reducing bias. That's awesome. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn the recording off.